On today's episode of Locked On Pistons Podcast, we are going to be joined by Cade Cunningham's brother, Cannon Cunningham, to talk about what makes Cade Cunningham so special and the Detroit Pistons future next season and beyond on today's episode of the Locked On Pistons Podcast. You are Locked On Pistons, your daily Detroit Pistons podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's the deal? Welcome back to another episode of the Locked On Pistons podcast. Per usual, I'm your host, Kuka Hill. You can find me over on Twitter, at Kuka Hill. I want to thank you guys for making Locked On Pistons your first listen of every single day. We're free and available on all your podcast platforms. And if you haven't already, head to the YouTube channel, at Locked On Pistons. Hit that subscribe button, or leave us a five-star review on whatever podcast platform you're listening to this on. That's another great way to support the podcast. And for those of you guys who are watching on YouTube, you will see we have a special guest here, Cannon Cunningham. Brother of Cade Cunningham. Cannon, I want to thank you so much, man, for coming to the house, recording in person. Like, this is super dope. I appreciate it, for real, for real. Yeah, no problem. Glad to be here, man. So, the first thing I want to talk about with you, and we, we kind of talked about it before um, before we started recording, is there's a few things we're going to talk about, what to expect from Cade, the Pistons Young Corps moving forward, um, and what makes Cade Cunningham special. So, to start off with what makes Cade special, so I'm a – for those of you guys listening on the podcast, we're going to break it down for you as best as possible. But I'm going to move in, and we're going to play, we're going to play a clip here that I pulled from Cade's last season, um, like in the few games he was able to play here. Um, and this game is against the OKC Thunder. You're going to see Cade try to run a high pick and roll here with Isaiah Stewart, and the OKC Thunder are going to come out, and they're going to give a hard hedge to Cade and try to get the ball out of his hands. And Cade's going to bring the hard hedge all the way out. And he could make a quick pass to Isaiah Stewart here, and but he decides against it because they're running some kind of Spain action for Sadiq Bay. So he knows if he can just wait for Sadiq to get out the lane and pull his defender out, he won't have to worry about that help defender coming up on Stu. If he can just wait a second and he anticipates what the defense is going to do, if he just waits a second, he can get Stu a wide-open layup, and that's exactly what he does. He gets Stu a wide-open layup right here. So... Cannon, what I want to ask you is this. Obviously, you being his brother, you've known him his whole life. Was there was there ever a point before he, you know, maybe before high school, or maybe it was high school, but before college or anything, before he got to the NBA, where you noticed, like, like his feel for the game, his IQ for the game, his anticipation, they're like, okay, that's special. Because there's a lot of things that makes Cade special, obviously. But I feel like, to me, what makes him special is his ability to see the game anticipate the defense and make the right read before the defense even knows what's coming? Yeah, I would say, um, honestly, I would say he's always had a, a really good feel for the game. Um, you know, from the time he was a baby, I was already playing basketball. So he, he grew up watching my games. And, um, you know, even even as a young player, he, he was a big um, and he had a great passing feel and he just didn't have the handle to match. But, um, you know, his – AAU program was great, and they let him kind of transfer transition into a, a point forward type, and eventually into a full time point guard. Um, but the field was always there. I think when we tried to convert him to point guard, it was just a ton of ball screen reps, and so he got to see really every variation of a defensive coverage to to pick and roll, side pick and roll, high pick and roll. Uh, you know, transition drags, you name it. He was trying all those different things and. He really bought into, you know, figuring out what defensive tendencies look like, what uh, opportunities he can take advantage of. And on the clip he just showed, I think it was it was cool because you don't always see hard hedges in the middle of the court. Right. And uh, usually it's, it's going to be more on, on side pick and rolls. And um, there's a little trick where you can, you can wait for the big man to leave and he's going to kind of intersect with his teammate for a second, and you can use that opportunity to get downhill toward the middle. And score field. for yourself, right. And I thought that clip was cool because it was the same instance. I'm sure he, he hasn't practiced a lot of hard hedges going toward the sideline, but he was still able to find that same advantage. And, and it started with a good screen by Stu, first and foremost. But he was able to hold that defender off and then stay patient enough until – the, the numbers advantage played out on the backside. Whoever the help guy was at the rim had to make a decision. Am I going to get out to the shooter or right. take the rim? And, you know, Cade's patient enough to just make him be wrong, whatever he chooses. 
So uh, I really had he play, and you know I I love that he's gotten the ball in his hands so much early in his career. I didn't think that was a given coming in just because of his size, um, but it's been cool to see him just continue to develop as a pick and roll player. And uh, I hope this year he can begin to you know control the game a little more than he has in the past. I, I think he does a good job of taking over in spots, but uh, the consistency. Consistency, <clears throat> excuse me, is going to come from just taking care of it a little more, and uh, you know I, I think obviously his his leg being healed now is is a factor, but I think he's ready to take another step in the maturity direction and uh, really control the pace of games this year is my hope. All right, so I thought that was I think that's all that was great stuff right there, but I have another question now too because. Again, that clip was just a, a brief example of like wh- why I think Kate's special with this feel for the game like you described. What else was – outside of the feel, what else did you see from an early age? Or maybe even if there's something right now that you've seen him develop in his short time in the NBA, short time playing – I think he was one year in college and then uh, so far through the NBA, a short time – that you th- that you see from K that you feel like yeah that's that's what makes him special that's what makes him the number one overall pick that's what makes him the face of the Pistons is there anything because everyone talks about different things everyone has a different thing from K that they really like is there one specific thing outside of the field that you can think of that comes to you as like yeah that's what made Cade Cade? Uh, I mean I think it's pretty well known at this point just his leadership abilities. Um, he's really easy to talk to. And I think he's attentive of, you know, what people's other people's interests are, or you know, what may motivate them, or or uh, get them going, or slow them down. And uh, he he really does a good job of, of balancing, you know, and an idea of each each of his teammates in his mind, and knowing what buttons to press with everybody. Um, you know, and he's just a really hard worker. Uh, you know, I don't always feel like we've maybe worked the most efficiently, but it's never been a question of him wanting to put the reps in and, you know, being committed to giving it his all in every workout. So I would say his leadership and, and his motor are probably the, the two differentiators for me. So, and, and you brought up something right there that I, I kind of want to ask another question about. And you talked about, you know, he's always been a hard worker. Maybe sometimes you felt like it wasn't the most efficient, but always – the, a really hard worker. Obviously, you mentioned earlier with the leg injury that he had, the, the surgery he ended up having. How did the surgery that he had, and him obviously not being able to play basketball for a while, how how did that impact his work, his workouts, his training over the past, uh, how long has it been, like nine nine months, I think it is, eight months? Um, how has that affected, if at all, his workouts, and do you expect that to affect him at all, or do you, expect, do you think he got the right amount he's getting the right amount of work in that he would want to have in any other offseason moving forward. Yeah, I would say he's right on schedule. I think the Pistons have done a great job uh, monitoring his progress, uh, pushing him, but also, you know, keeping in perspective that it's a long race, you know, and there's no reason to rush this process. Um, but as far as our workout so far this summer, he, he's moving well, he looks strong. Um, I, I would pretty much say he's healthy at this point. I think it's just about, you know, getting some some game reps now. Perfect, perfect. All right, so I have a funny thing to say. Did you – are you on social media at all? Uh, I'm just a lurker. I don't really post anything, but I I see plenty. Did you see, like, it was like a week and a half ago. Did you see the memes going around with Cade? Fat Cade? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yes, Fat. Did you see the – you saw the Fat Cade stuff? What's crazy is the beard they kept putting on him is like my beard (laughs) two days ago. I I (laughs) – I got cleaned up a little bit for this, but so we can yeah. confirm that he there is no fat Cade. We can confirm that, that he is nah, he's no in shape. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. it's it's not a real picture. We actually uh, left a workout the other day, uh, the, maybe a week or two ago, and uh, somebody saw Cade walking out to his car, and they ran over and got a picture and stuff. And he was like, "Wait, I thought you were fat." <laughs> no <laughs> way, like, for real. Can't believe everything you see on the internet. <laughs> It was so crazy because it actually, like, I, I got on Twitter and I see it, and it's like jokes, whatever. I'm like, okay, whatever. And then I saw it get, like, tweeted out by, like, an actual account, and I'm like, 
people are gonna start thinking like this is yeah, like I, this I didn't is know real. If it was just like Pistons Twitter doing this, or or how widespread it's, it was, but it got kind of picked up. It's crazy. It was his own people, man. It was Pistons crazy. Twitter. They start making it. It'd it be your I own. Mean, it was well done, though. I mean, it, the, the pictures were pretty. <laughs> it was. It was. But it'd be it'd be your own people sometimes, man. I couldn't believe it. But all right, so. Before we wrap up this this sub, uh, this segment, and then we'll move on to what to expect from Cade in his second season or his third season. Um, I have a trivia question for you. So for those of you guys who may not know, Cannon played basketball himself in college, four-year player at Southern Methodist. I have a trivia question about your own co- career. Do you think that you'll be able to answer? Do you just without even knowing what the question is? Do you think you'll be able to answer it? Yeah. Okay. What is your career high in points in college? <sighs> <laughs> I don't know actually. Um uh, twenty four points maybe. Okay. Do you so before I tell you what the career high is, do you have any idea who it was against? Hofstra? Okay, so I'm sorry to tell you that but you were wrong. <laughs> 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 but your career high was twenty points. I believe it was your second season at Southern Methodist. And it was against Ryder University. Does that ring a bell at all? That game at all? Uh, not really. <laughs> you had a, you had a few other games at 18 points, but this one was your career high in points. Um, I also was I was going to ask you how many games um, you played your second season, but I thought that would be too easy. I don't know if you actually missed any games or not. Actually, so I have no idea on any of these questions. Oh, fair enough, fair <laughs> enough. Okay, so they could have been some good questions. I'll save that one actually for later then, give you a guess. I do I'll have the answer up. for that. I'll study up. For next time. <laughs> I got you, I got you. All right, so when we come back, we're going to talk about what should we expect from Cade in his third season. Um, essentially, it'd probably be, I'm going to consider it his second season. He didn't really get to play. But in his third season in the NBA, we'll talk about that when we come back. Um, but first, I've got to tell you guys about one of our sponsors, Ibotta. Picking up burgers and hot dogs from a summer bre- barbecue, you know you're already doing it, so why not get cash back for it with Ibotta? Ibotta gives you cash back on hundreds of grocery items from pr- from produce to personal care to pantry goods so you can make sure you're beating inflation no matter what you're purchasing. Either link your loyalty account or upload your receipt after you shop and get cash back. It's just that easy. Other apps give you points that don't amount to much. With Ibotta, you get cash back that you can actually cash out to your bank account, PayPal, or gift cards. You can earn cash back on hundreds of online brands and retailers too when you start with Ibotta, including Lowe's, Macy's, Sephora, Best Buy, and more. And right now, Ibotta is offering our listeners $5 just for trying Ibotta by using code LOCKED when you register. Just go to the App Store or Google Play Store and download the free Ibotta app and use code LOCKED. That's I-B-O-T-T in the Google Play or App Store and use code LOCKED with Ibotta. So I want to thank you guys again for making Lockdown Pistons your first listen of every single day. We're free and available on all your podcast platforms. If you haven't already, head to the YouTube channel at Lockdown Pistons. Hit that subscribe button. Or leave us a five-star review on whatever podcast platform you're listening to this on. That's another great way to support the podcast. So, Cannon, before we get into what to expect from Kate, I am going to ask you that second trivia question now about your career. How many games and starts did you have in your second season with Southern Methodist? Uh, I don't know. So maybe I'll give some context. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. As a filler. Um, Matt Doherty was the coach my freshman year. Um, we had a bad season. He got fired, and I was ready to transfer out. And, uh, you know, honestly, I just was ready for a new start somewhere else. Um, I didn't really care who they brought in as the new coach. They hired Larry Brown, and I still was like, yeah, I'm, I want to go. You know, I, I don't want to play for this old guy. <laughs> right. You know, and the idea of being recruited again and, and desired all over again was appealing to me. Um, my parents convinced me, you know, you got three years left, just stay here for another year. If you don't like the new guy, then you can transfer out and just have time. Okay, fine. That's what I did. Um, and so Larry got there and pretty much cleared house. And so, so my roommate and I were the only ones on the previous roster that survived the, the you know, change of coaches. Um, he brought in a bunch of his own guys, but that year they had to sit out. So <laughs> pretty much it was – uh, or two of my roommates, actually, excuse me. Myself, uh, my two buddies, and a bunch of transfers and stuff like that. So I got a lot of playing time my sophomore year because of that. 
And then after that, it was pretty much LB's guys got, got <laughs> most of the burn. But we had great teams, and it was a it was a wonderful experience. So to answer your question, uh, I probably played twenty eight games. So it was it's close. You played thirty two games. You started all thirty two. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You played thirty two, thirty two, nice. and started all thirty two of them. Nice. You did have a good season that year too. All right. So let's get into what we expect from Cade heading into his third technical third NBA season. So I'm actually going to let you take over from this one. What are you expecting just as someone who works with Cade, obviously his brother, what are you expecting to see from Cade in his third season coming off the injury, um, coming in with the, it seems like a lot of new additions to the Pistons. We don't know if there's going to be more additions. We we don't know yet, but so far there's a, uh, a few additions. What are you expecting from Cade with the Pistons this year? Like I said earlier, I'd, I'd like to see him take a step forward as a game manager. Um, super proud of the way he's been able to score and create for others, you know, thus far. Um, but, you know, I'm, we're all tired of watching us lose. So um, I think a lot of that's going to fall on his shoulders, just how well he can control the pace of the game and involve guys. Um, to to segue a little bit, I, I'm – Super excited about Asar Thompson. Oh, yeah. So am I. And I, I hope that we can figure out the best way to utilize him. Uh, I, you know, I know Kay's really eager to start that learning journey as well. But, um, yeah, managing games, getting the most out of your teammates. Um, I saw he was second in the odds for, for most improved yep. player. I, that would be wonderful. Um, you know, all-star, that would be great hoping for all those types of things, all NBA, whatever. But, um, you know, just just I'd like to see some steps toward winning basketball. Not to say that he's not – I think he plays winning basketball, but it's got to be more contagious. Um, and that's really what I'm hoping to see from him and the team this year. So I think that's what – I think there's some interesting things you said because – I, obviously, I record the podcast five days a week. I have to talk about the team five days a week. I have to talk about Cade a lot. And I love watching Cade. I love talking about Cade. But you mentioned that not only, you know, some of the players, but the fan base is obviously getting sick of losing. Like, they don't want to lose no more. They want to win. Um, but for me, it's like, and I want to get, get your perspective on it, someone who's close with Cade. Is obviously we all like. I think Cade is going to be a future MVP. I think he has that type of two-way ability. I think he can run an offense. I think he can be a powerhouse, a powerhouse offense in and of himself. I think he's going to be absolutely fantastic. But he's only 21, 22 years old. He's coming off an injury. How do you balance as as someone close with Cade and someone who works with Cade? How do you think Cade balances the the obvious expectations and want of I want to be an all-star. I want to be an MVP. I want to get this team to the playoffs. I want to get to the championship. Balancing that with, like, realistic expectations of, okay, we got a long way to go. I'm young. I still have a long, you know, I have a long career in front of me. I'm trying to get better at this, that, and the other. How do you balance both of those? Because you do want to have high goals for yourself. You do want to see the team win a lot of games. I think you were on, um, was it Woodward Pistons? You and Aston were on there. And they asked you guys about, um, what you expect from the team next year? How many like how many games they're going to win? Do you expect playoffs, etc.? Just how do you how do you feel you balance both those the expectations for yourself and wanting to achieve high things while also not putting too much on yourself? I think if there is a way to balance it, Kay will figure it out. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I've never been the face of a franchise, You're right? <laughs> you know, so I can't really advise on everything, but. Um, I saw something pretty interesting maybe a couple of weeks ago on Twitter that basically some stat guy figured out that you can't win a championship unless you have a top three player in the league. Right. And so, you know, it's easy for, for me and our fan base to get swept up in all this team building stuff and what should Troy do and, you know, I would have done this differently or whatever. But until, you know, I don't, I don't see a way that we can be a real threat in the East until – our big three is better than other teams' big threes. And we're not just, you know, a young core anymore. Right. We're a real big three. Or we're a real dynamic duo or whoever's around. I don't know. But until our guys are actually legitimately better than other teams' guys, you know, these 
these uh, role players and interchangeable pieces that, you know, shift a, a roster year to year aren't really all that important in the grand scheme of things, you know. So I think Kate understands that it ultimately is going to ride on his shoulders, you know, how, how far this team can go. Um, but I, I also think he understands that, you know, we're not in a position to – to make a deep run right now. So I don't think he has unrealistic expectations for himself, but he knows that it's going to fall on his shoulders eventually. So I love hearing that because I, my expectations for Cade this year is I, I'd like to see him. I think he could win most improved player of the year. I think he could be a borderline all-star this year because the thing that I, the thing, the reason why I asked that question is because as someone who's obviously not in the NBA, but loves basketball, and obviously analyzes basketball and watches Kate all the time is, and and wants the Pistons to succeed is that I I want to put expectations on Cade, but I don't want to put expect I don't want the fan base or anyone to put expectations on Cade. They're just unrealistic and really unfair. Because for example, one of the main yeah, compa- but he, that's, I Go think ahead. that's part of being the number one pick. Right, right. And um, I actually asked him in our in our pre draft. Uh, time together. Do you want to go first? And I mean, like it's it's a no brainer. Of course, we don't want to be the number one pick. But there was a lot of things to consider. Like you know, we're from Texas. Houston has the second pick. Um, there was you know whispers that uh, maybe Troy likes Jalen Green, and I was just like, we don't have to. <laughs> you know, you can we can maybe maneuver this thing a little bit. And he was like, no, nah, man, I want to go first. I want to always be the number one guy in my class. And so he understands the, the stuff that comes with that. Of course, people are going to have super high expectations for him. That's that's the bed that he made, you know. And uh, you know, I I really Wimby's first game when he was he played pretty bad. <laughs> you watched yesterday. You watched yesterday yeah, yeah. game. I felt bad for him just because I remember like the unreal nerves that we have for Kay's first right first game, and just like yeah, you you. You reach that pinnacle, you reach that goal, you can check that off. But now it's like, here's the consequence of setting that goal. Mm-hmm. Is everybody expects you, to, you know, be perfect from here on out. And so he didn't. I don't feel like he played his best basketball, you know, in summer league. And obviously, there's not really a correlation to NBA success based on summer league success. But um, it's been cool to like be so close to this, and you know, it just becomes more and more humanizing you know you you see the players as players and people and like you have encounters with them off the court or in the club or the restaurant or whatever and you get to know them as like oh you're not just marvin Bagley who averages this and right <laughs> you right know what i'm saying you're marvin Bagley the person or or whoever the person might be it's been really cool for me to experience that um i don't even i'm so lost no you're your good i thought started. No, I thought I thought what you said there was great, and thank you for saying all that because it is fair. He is the number one overall pick, and I, it's great. I think one of the things that makes a lot of Pistons fans, including including myself, so like confident in Cade to be the face of the franchise and lead them back is because of the maturity, not just from him, it feels, but from his camp, the people around him, and the things you said right there is like a great level of maturity and self awareness that not only just vi- this sprays like vibes off of Cade but like it feels like it vibes off of this team too and I think that speaks highly to again who he surrounds himself with and how he carries himself as a person like you mentioned earlier why like one of his special traits which is leadership maturity and his self-awareness so you know maybe you know I'm I'll cut some I'll cut some fans some slack now because <laughs> some fans do be having some crazy expectations of him I'm like dude he's like he's coming off an injury this is really his second season like let's tune it down a little bit but like you said, you do when you go first overall pick and you're dubbed like the face of the franchise. There is some expectations that could put on you, whether it's fair or unfair. And I, it's again, I'd want to put heavy emphasis on the fact that that's what really I feel like makes people so confident in Cade is that he knows that and he hasn't shied away from it. He hasn't ran away from that. Like he absorbs it and he's completely cool with it. So yeah. I, I think that's it's just another one of those things that speaks to like what makes Cade great. And makes Cade special. So, yeah, I thought I thought that was some insightful answers. I'm not gonna lie to you. I appreciate it. Um, I do want to say this. I'm expecting 
uh, most improved player of the year. I think that will be easy for him. I think people are like kind of underrating him right now. Do you feel like they're like kind of forgetting about him a little bit? I mean, we don't play on TV, and I don't right. think anybody's going on the NBA app to go find the Pistons. And see right, that, right. So. I mean, I, I get it. But, yeah, I, I do think nationally he's underrated. But, you know, out of sight, out of mind. So, I don't know how many TV games we'll get this year either. But, hey. you know, Kate will know which ones they are. And right. I'm, I'm sure he'll do his thing. So, I I think that he's – I feel like he's forgotten about to a point to where, like, next year he's going to be – like, he's going to show up and just be – like, before he got that last Boston game, I believe it was, he was averaging, like, 21, 6, and 6. I think he could come out next year and average, like, 23 – seven and six, whatever, and people are nationally going to be like, oh, my God, he's good? He can do, like, yeah. he can oh, do that? Sure. Yeah, and all of us and all of us here are going to be like, yeah, he, like, <laughs> he, he's been doing that. Like, he can do that. But everyone else is going to be like, oh, God, he's made such a big jump. And I feel like that will what, like that's what's going to win him. Yeah, most see, improved. at first I thought he wouldn't, like, before the odds came out, I thought maybe he wouldn't get it because his numbers were too good last year. Right. But then, like, I've been seeing a lot of arguments and people saying, like, well, John Morant shouldn't have won it. And so, I mean, yeah, I guess I guess there's a chance. But I, to me, I always feel like it's going to be some guy that went from a super limited role to now playing a real role and right. getting respectable stats. I, yeah, I but, think those are the guys that should win it. No, I agree with honest. that. I, I agree with that. But like you said, I think that we've had some examples over the last few years when that hasn't – they've kind of shifted towards yeah. like the the – really good player that all of a sudden makes a jump to stardom or something like that, like that kind of thing. But I do agree with you. I think that – I feel like the the purpose of the award was to reward guys who go, like, from bench players or whatever to, like, oh, they're starting level players. They could be, like, something like that. I do agree with that, though. Um, I, mean, I, I welcome it, though. We want the award. No, I – no, I, I – <laughs> trust me. I, I, I feel it. I feel it. Um, but, all right, when we come back, we'll talk about the Pistons' young core moving forward – how does Cannon feel about the young core and what they can do next season and moving forward? We'll talk about that when we come back. But first, I've got to tell you guys about one, some of our lovely sponsors. So I want to thank you guys again for making Locked On Pistons your first listen of every single day. We're free and available on all your podcast platforms. If you haven't already, head to the YouTube channel at Locked On Pistons. Hit that subscribe button or leave us a five-star review on whatever podcast platform you're listening to us on. That's another great way to support the podcast. So before we get into this segment, I do just want to say this is – I want to thank you again for coming over and recording in person because this is super dope. This is the first, I think, I think this is the first, like, in-person interview I've ever done um, for the podcast. A few years ago, I was credentialed and got to interview some players in the locker room. But this is the first, like, interview I've had, been able to do in person on the podcast. So I really do appreciate you coming over um, and recording in person because this is super dope. I, and I hope all of you guys appreciate it and enjoy it as well. So I just want to say thank you again for that. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. I love your setup in here. Yeah, I was okay. So thank you for saying that because I was gonna say. Now I'm not balling on a budget like Kate is or anything. You feel me? But what do you feel about the what do you feel about the setup, man? I think it's pretty nice. I'm not gonna lie to you. Now the Stafford jersey can be replaced with another Piston jersey. You feel me? No, no, no. we love Stafford. (laughs) We love Stafford. I mean, no complaints. You got the Piston swag. It's tidy, well lit. Yeah, you see, you see Buzz the light. You see the light. Yeah, yeah, Buzz and Woody. Yep, you feel it. You got, you got to keep some of that kid, kid stuff with you. You feel yeah, me? I'm gonna, I'm gonna go eight and a half out of ten. It's appreciate, it, appreciate. It. So before we move forward, I just want to say this. So before you came, I just to uh, pull you guys behind the curtain a little bit. So if you guys watch my other videos, I have that piston blanket laid out across the whole bed, and my wife who's in the other room right now. She was like. um, I don't think you should have the piston blanket. It's a little too much with the piston stuff. So let me go get you a comforter. So she went and bought a comforter, <laughs> laid it down. She's like, uh, I think this yeah. looks way. I think this looks yeah, way better. I think she was right. <laughs> the limited, the limited piston swag looks nice. All right. Okay. So she's gonna love to hear that. She's probably listening. Accented. Yes. Yeah, so she's probably listening. That's why she's an interior designer and I'm not. So there you go. Oh yeah. Right <laughs> but all right. So. What do you expect? Let's just cut straight to it. What do you expect from the Pistons next year, man? Because I've I've seen what you believe in other interviews. I've seen you talk about it. I've seen when asked you in things. And I feel like you guys <laughs> you guys might be on two different wavelengths with this one. I think we're on the same wavelength now. <laughs> you on the same one now? <laughs> oh, wait, did, wait, did he so, wait, did he come down or did you go up? Uh, he saw the light. I mean, he, <laughs> I'm not gonna air him out too much. 
but I, I think he feels he was a bit aggressive. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> um, I mean, I still would love us to get the 10 seed. I think that's maybe ambitious. Um, but, I mean, that's the beauty of the play in, though. Like, it's, it makes more teams relevant, you know. Um, I, don't, I mean, Monty's got his work cut out for him. I think, I think we have a lot of really talented, interesting players. Um, but I don't feel like there's a clear-cut way to play. With them, obviously, Monty has his preferences, but also he's going to have to tailor to his roster a little bit. <clears throat> um, we're still young. I mean, I know we picked up some vets, but you know, one thing for me, veteran leadership has to be like there has to be time put into any relationship. And you know, if if we're just going to get a guy that's going to be moved at the deadline or something. Yeah, you have a vet, but if he hasn't established a real relationship with anybody, then, you know, what's the point of having a veteran? Um, I won't – I don't <laughs> – I am I got nervous coming on here because I'm like, ah, I can't – I got to be Mr. Politician. <laughs> I can't really dive too deep. Um, but I will say, you know, I'm, I'm happy with this draft. I'm happy with last draft. I think we, we got some – like real 95th percentile athletes. Right. Especially you mentioned earlier, Asar Thompson, a fantastic athlete. Yeah. Um, but I, I would say a 10 seed is a, is, would be like a huge W for me. So I, I think I completely agree with that. I think 10 seed would be like a successful season. That would be like way successful. Like then you're like, I feel like then some players would be overachieving or maybe not overachieving, taking a step that maybe was bigger than expected from outside of obviously Cade, but like the surrounding pieces, because Cade can't do it by himself. Um, but like you mentioned, the team is very young. They're they're a very young team, um, and it's just hard for me to I, again. It goes back to why I said earlier. I don't want to put too crazy expectations on guys who are just so young. Um, Jalen Durant is not even early old enough to drink, um, like. Some of the uh, – Isaiah Stewart, still 21-22. Um, Jane Ivey, obviously, so 21-22. Cade, obviously, is still really young coming off an of injury. So, for me, well, all I need to see this year, I'd like to see them. I don't know how much um, – I don't know how much basketball you watch, NBA basketball you watched outside the Pistons last season. But if the Pistons were to be this year's version of last year's Orlando Magic, where, like, they win – you know, because Orlando, everyone feels strongly about Orlando's future. I believe after, like, the first 25 games, they played 500 basketball the rest of the way. Everyone knows Paolo's that guy for them. Like, Franz is good. Um, Markel took another jump. Wendell Carter. Like, all these guys, they, they feel very strongly about their future. They didn't make the playoffs, but everyone now is like, okay, yeah, that team's coming. They're, they're going to be somewhere soon. So if the Pistons could be that, that this year where guys at the end of the year, yeah, maybe they don't make the playoffs, but everyone's looking at them like, yeah, they're like they're coming soon. They're going to be here. Cade's that dude. Ivy's his running mate. Like Duran's that dude. Like all these guys, Asar, like all this stuff. They know people outside of Detroit. Even obviously the fans in Detroit also feel like, yeah, they're coming next year. That might be their time. Like we can feel good about where we're heading. Um, I, obviously a step back would be if you feel the opposite of that. It's like okay, what what's going on? Like what's happening? But I think the simple. I, I don't really want to put a win total on it. Just for me. At the end of the season, if I'm like, yep, Cade is that dude and the guys around him are the right guys to have around him and in a few years they're going to be it, I feel confident feeling that way. I think it's a successful season. Agreed. Um, how do we get there? How do you how do you feel about the two bigs? <laughs> are you, so I'm going to ask you this. Are you, I'm, are you, I'm asking the questions. <laughs> are you setting me up? Do you, so do you know how I feel about the two bigs and you're no, asking really me? No, I really don't. Um, I'm trying to decide. Do I want to be no, Mr. Politician? Be politician. <laughs> um, I don't like the two bigs. I don't think two bigs work. Um, I okay. Actually, let me rephrase that. If you have the right two bigs, then you can run two bigs. Like for example, if you're Boston and you got Horford and Williams, like that. Okay, that makes sense. Horford can guard in the perimeter. He can switch. He can space the floor really well. You can run that. Um. Like Milwaukee, Giannis, if you want to count him as a big, Giannis and, and Brooke, 
Brooks spaces the floor, turns in, turned himself into a great three point shooter, can space the floor and stuff. Um, the Piston guys, I I know Weaver loves the two big stuff, and if you have the right two bigs, I'm completely cool with it. I just question whether the Pistons have enough versatility with the bigs they do have, and the skill sets of the bigs they have are those skill sets that you want together on the floor together, or is it ones you want separated? How do you can I re, can I reverse it back to you? Yeah, can you? Nah, I totally agree with you. Okay, I just feel like there's not enough uh, there's not enough variety of skill set in our front court. Like right, we, you know, there's a bunch of guys that can score on the block but don't really do it at a really efficient level and can make a three, which we've seen them all make a three now, but aren't really shooters, you know? And I, I really was most troubled with just like, okay, when, when you play a real stretch four like Jabari, neither one of those guys really want to go out there. And right. Play, you know? So, and then, and then offensively, now this is summer league and I'm not trying to overreact, <clears throat> but you know, it gave us our first glimpse of, what this season. Well, they did. They did also try to run some of it at the end of last season. Like Casey did run out some lineups with Wiseman and Dern and Wiseman and Bagley, whatever. Like we got, yeah. we got some taste of it a little bit at the end of last season. I would have liked to see, like, if you're gonna play two bigs, let's run some two big offensive sets where they are working with each other instead of standing one of our centers in the corner, right? Making him act like a stretch four when when that's not what he is. But, I mean, I think – I do believe in Wiseman's jump shot development. I think he's been great in the summer league. Um, but the other issue with the with the two bigs is I just feel like they're posting up Wiseman a lot. And you've got so many guys that can get in the lane almost at will. And, and Thompson, Ivy, I'll put Cade in there. Right. But if there's no, if there's no space in there, once I get in there – and now my, my kick-out options are other guys that want to drive it. You know, I, it just feels like it could get a little clogged up. Right. I don't know. This is all hypothetical, and I'm sure Monty can, can work through this a little bit. So, I can, but. You, you, so I'm, I'm going to break this to you. You probably don't mean to do this. But by the time all of you guys listen to this, <laughs> you probably just started like a war. <laughs> you, you probably just started a war. You just lit, took a took a match and just threw it like you, just, <laughs> you probably just started something because I don't know if you've seen it, but this has been like a a big uh, point of arguments in like the business community about the two big stuff. Um, so I just want to let you know you definitely just like I'll say this. Just, I'll just, say this. I, I thought it was really encouraging what what. Durant showed. I like that they let him rock out a little bit. And, right. You know, got to get in his bag. But also, I don't want them to get too cute with him. You know? mm-hmm. I think I think there's plenty of time for him to become that kind of player. But I would, first, I would like to see him get dominant in an area so that he has an inherent advantage every time he steps on the court. All right. You know, and I mean, maybe I'm just an old school type of guy. I would love to see him become a dominant post player and just – put a simple package together that he can go to consistently. Um, and same for Wiseman. I, I think Wiseman wants to post up more, but he's just spamming them too much. Right. Uh, and there's not really clean footwork to get into his post-ups. I think I think he would benefit from a lot more early drags and just, you know, whenever you want to. Like, don't even wait for a play. Just go get a ball screen and roll. Right. And everybody wants to throw it up to him. Right, exactly. He's just camped out too much right now. And – you know, obviously they haven't really had any practice time and they probably want to see what he looks like on the low block. And I think he's doing a great job. I'm, I'm not trying to knock him at all, but I just – I don't – my first impression of the too big thing didn't really turn me on. It, it's – it's <laughs> so I'm trying <laughs> – this is a fun question for you to ask because, again, like I mentioned, it's been a hot topic, of, especially of – I'll just go ahead and admit it, of the Locked on Pistons podcast. I've talked about the two big stuff a lot, <laughs> a lot, <laughs> about whether I think it's good or not. Um, <laughs> so I, I basically what I want to say is I basically completely agree with you. Like with Wiseman, I think if you're going to try to develop him and, and make him a part of the future, I completely agree. You want to get him in like actions where he's going towards the basket and he's able to use his athleticism and like his, his uh, shiftiness and agility to try to score around the basket because he does have a really nice touch. 
And I agree that also posting up too much can clog up the paint for guys um, and and shut off some driving lanes. So I completely agree with you. Um, a little bit last year, too, when he just came, when Wiseman just came after the deadline, I, I'm just interested to see what, what Monty does. Because last year, it felt like that Wiseman, obvi- and it makes sense, but Wiseman and Casey in the coaching staff, they were they were all trying to figure out how to use use Wiseman. And how, you know, what kind of offense we run with him, what kind of sets we run in, what kind of actions and stuff. And it did result in just a lot of like, okay, I'm posting up, like, try to give me the ball because I feel like they didn't really know how to use each other yet. And it makes sense. You acquire, you acquire a guy like that. You don't get a lot of practice time. It's not like, I think, what's his name? I think JJ Redick and uh, Paul George talked about this, that there's not a lot of practice time anymore in the NBA. It's not like they're practicing hard all the time in the off days. It's not like that. So I get that. So I'm I'm really interested to see how Monty decides to use Wiseman, um, not just Wiseman, but Duran and and the rest of the bigs too. So I'm interested to see how they use it. But to to answer the question, no, I'm not I'm not the biggest fan of the two bigs. If they were to go two bigs and like the starting lineup, Stu would be the guy I'd pick it for because he's the one I feel like has proven the most with the ability to p- potentially become a good shooter. So if you're going to bet on one guy, I'd bet on Stu doing it. Um, is that the one thing you need from Stu is just to improve three ball? I, I think the three ball is the big start because you need that. If you're going to start him, he has to have that. But he, I think he needs to be able to branch stuff off of that too. So, like, for example, attack a closeout and then make the right read off attacking the gap, um, kick out and stuff, maybe a dump off. Uh, if you run a screen and roll with him, he has to be able to hit a short roll read pass to the corner or whatever, like stuff like that. Um, but if he does, th- that's all advanced stuff. You do if you become all that stuff along with being a great shooter. You're talking about like an all star, like at that point. But like, if if he's a good shooter at the four, I think you you probably can get away with running two bigs because he's he's versatile defensively. He can guard one through five. Um, so it's more so just offensively. Will he will he become a good enough shooter? Not just to make them, but like to make the defense respect him enough to where there's like gravity there, to where guys are like running out to him and guys have driving lanes. So. I think Stu has the best – if I had to bet on someone, I'd say Stu has the best chance out of the bigs that could do it. Um, but as of right now, I'm not going to put you on the spot and make you answer. But if I had to pick a starting lineup as of right now, I probably would go Cade, Ivy, Asar, Livers, Duran. That That's the starting lineup I'd go with. Over. All right, I'm, yeah, I'm so, so, look, so I'll give you my reasoning. I'm, I'll, give you, I'll give you the reasoning for Livers. And then – if you want to answer, you can. I'm not going to put you on the spot. Then we can wrap up the podcast. But I go with Livers at the four because he's a good team defender, and I know he can shoot. And I think next to Cade and Ivy, you don't need guys who – you don't need other dudes that want a lot of usage and need a lot of usage. You just need guys that complement what they're doing and can feed off of the advantages they create for each other. Um, like Cade's a great – I think Cade's a fantastic advantage creator, not just for himself but for others. And he's a great passer out of it too. So when he creates an advantage for others, he'll make it like he'll make the right pass off of it. So you just need guys who can take advantage of that stuff. I think Livers can do that. I think he's a smart player. Um, and then defensively, he's a little undersized, but I tr- he makes the right rotation a lot of the time. Like he knows where to go and how to play defense. It's just a matter of can he make the play. Um, and I trust him the most with that right now. And again, I think the biggest thing is not only is he a good team defender. I think he's the most proven shooter right now on the roster that can play the four. Boyan, but I don't want – I think Boyan's defense at the four kind of kind of limits that a little bit. So I think if you want the perfect balance of the two, I'd go with Livers at, at the four. But I, I understand it's it's open. It's fluid right now. So we'll, we'll find out yeah, what they do. I don't think there's the right answer right, right. Now today. So that, that was a fine answer. I'm cool with that. Fair enough, fair enough. And I'm gonna plead the fifth on this. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say, yeah, you you're <laughs> you you've you've done enough. You you already sparked enough fire with the two big stuff yeah. at all. Um all right, so last question I have for you the podcast, quick answer, and then we'll wrap up. If you had to take a guess right now that the Pistons make a move before the regular season, do you think they make another move? Yes. All right. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> I won't ask you what move you think. I'll I'll leave it alone like at that. Um <laughs> But I appreciate you guys listening. Cannon, appreciate you, man. It was a ton of fun, man. I appreciate you coming over. This was super dope, man. I appreciate it a ton, man. Yeah, I appreciate um, the hospitality. I had a great time. Yeah, appreciate you, man. Uh, all you guys, everyday listeners, appreciate you guys making Lockdown Pistons your first listen of every single day. 
free and available on all your podcast platforms. Hit that subscribe button at the YouTube channel. Leave us a five-star review on whatever podcast platform you're listening to this on. Until next time, I'll see you guys later. Stay safe. Peace out.